runway distances. Every pilot sees them on the airport chart. But do you really know what they mean? Understanding declared runway distances is crucial for safe takeoffs and landings. These distances determine whether you have enough runway to get airborne, stop safely in an emergency, or land without overrunning the pavement. In this video, we'll break down TORA, TODA, ASDA, landing distance available, and all the essential runway characteristics, including stopways, clearways, and how they impact aircraft performance. We'll also go into key calculations, such as the difference between landing distance available and the actual distance required to stop your aircraft, and much more. Understanding these distances isn't just a theoretical exercise, it's a critical part of every flight's performance planning, ensuring that pilots can operate safely within the limits of each runway. So, let's explain them one by one. Let's start with Takeoff Run Available, or TORA. TORA is the length of runway pavement that's declared available and suitable for the ground run of an aircraft during takeoff. This is the physical runway you can use to accelerate before rotation. However, TORA does not include any clearways or stopways. It's strictly the paved surface meant for takeoff. For most runways, TORA is simply the full length of the runway, but in some cases, it can be reduced due to displaced thresholds, obstacles, or local operational restrictions. That's why pilots must always check the airport charts to confirm the actual TORA available for their departure. Next, we have Takeoff Distance Available, or TODA. TODA is the total distance available for takeoff, which includes both the paved runway surface and any designated clearway beyond it. This is the TORA plus the clearway. But here's an important detail. Even though TODA is a longer distance than TORA, pilots cannot plan to rotate beyond the runway. Aircraft must always be airborne by the end of TORA. TODA only provides additional room for initial climb. Now. Let's talk about the clearway, a critical part of takeoff distance available. A clearway is an area beyond the paved runway that is free of obstacles and specifically designated for aircraft to safely climb out after takeoff. It's usually an extension of flat terrain, water, or specially prepared ground, but it is not a surface meant for rolling or accelerating. It's strictly for airborne aircraft. Regulatory authorities like ICAO and the FAA have specific requirements for clearways. For example, an ICAO clearway shall not exceed half the length of the Torah and shall extend laterally to a distance of at least 75 meters on each side of the extended center line of the runway. Next, we have the ASDA, Accelerate Stop Distance Available. ASDA is one of the most critical declared distances when it comes to rejected takeoff scenarios. ASDA is the total distance available for an aircraft to accelerate to decision speed V1, then abort the takeoff and come to a full stop, without running off the end of the runway. It includes both the takeoff run available, TORA, and, if present, a stopway. ASDA must consider numerous factors like the aircraft's performance, runway conditions, aircraft weight, atmospheric conditions, and available stopping devices like brakes or reverse thrust. V1 speed is used as the decision speed, which represents the speed at which a pilot must either choose to continue the takeoff or abort in the event of a critical situation. The takeoff decision speed, V1, and the distances to achieve or decelerate from V1 are established by the manufacturer and confirmed during certification testing for varying climatological conditions, operating weights, aircraft configuration, etc. And what is a stopway? A stopway is an area beyond the runway that is specifically prepared to provide extra stopping distance for aircraft 
that cannot stop in the standard runway length due to an aborted takeoff or an emergency landing due to factors like a wet or contaminated surface on the runway, brake failure or landing gear failure. Key features of a stopway include 1. Is an area at least as wide as the standard runway. 2. Is positioned upon the center line of the runway. And 3. Is able to support the aircraft without causing structural damage. So, you may ask, what is the difference between a stopway and a clearway? Do all runways have them? Well, no, not all runways have either a clearway or a stopway. That depends of the characteristics of each runway. A clearway is an area beyond the runway that is free of obstacles and designed to allow an aircraft to continue climbing safely after takeoff. However, it is not a surface where the aircraft can roll. The clearway is included in the takeoff distance available, TODE, but does not affect the takeoff roll itself. On the other hand, a stopway is a paved extension of the runway that is designed to support an aircraft during a rejected takeoff. If a pilot needs to abort at high speed, the stopway provides extra pavement to bring the aircraft to a safe stop. The stopway is included in the Accelerate Stop Distance available, ASDA. We will now see the landing distance available, LDA, one of the most important runway distances for every approach. LDA is the length of runway declared available for landing and the ground roll after touchdown. Unlike TORA or TODA, which focus on takeoff, LDA is all about stopping safely. It begins at the usable threshold and ends at the runway's stopping point, meaning displaced thresholds can reduce the LDA, even if the physical runway is longer. And what is a displaced threshold, you may ask? Well, a displaced threshold is a threshold that has been moved further down the runway, reducing the available landing distance. While the physical pavement is still there, aircraft cannot land before the displaced threshold. However, pilots can use the displaced portion for takeoff or rollout after landing. And why do airports have displaced thresholds? There are a few reasons. First, obstacle clearance. If there are buildings, trees, or terrain in the approach path, shifting the threshold ensures arriving aircraft have a safe glide slope. Second, runway condition. The first section of a runway may be worn out or damaged and unsuitable for landing impact but still usable for taxi or takeoff. And third, noise abatement. Some airports use displaced thresholds to move landing zones farther away from residential areas, reducing noise pollution. Okay, now that we have all runway physical distances, TORA, TOTA, ASDA, LDA, let's ask some questions. For example, can we have a TORA, take of run, available, shorter than the physical length of the runway? Well, yes. Many runway have a runway protection zone, a trapezoidal area that extends beyond the end of a runway to minimize risks in the event of an aircraft undershooting or overrunning the runway. Unlike clearways or stopways, the RPZ is not part of the declared distances. It's strictly a safety buffer that remains clear of buildings, roads, and other obstructions whenever possible. On the second part of this lesson, we are going to talk about required distances. That is what a pilot really needs to know to operate safely. Those are the calculated distances that we need to do in order to know if we can take off, land, or even reject a takeoff. Airlines and pilots don't just look at available distances. They must compare them with the aircraft's required distances based on weight, weather, and performance factors. Let's break them down one by one. Before we dive deeper into takeoff and landing performance, let's clarify an important concept. Screen height. Screen height is the altitude at which an aircraft is considered to have successfully transitioned 
from takeoff to climb or from approach to landing. It acts as a reference point for calculating required distances. Screen heights depend on what type of aircraft you fly, but for this video, I am only going to focus on JAR 25 aircrafts because that's what you're going to be flying if you reach the commercial pilot stage. Let's start with one of the most important. Takeoff distance required. This is the distance from the start of the roll to the point where the aircraft reaches the screen height. 35 feet for dry runways or 15 feet for wet runways. This includes the takeoff roll plus the initial airborne segment. Takeoff distance required must be compared with takeoff distance available to ensure the aircraft has enough distance to safely take off. This distance is the longest of. 1. The distance from the start of the ground roll to the point where the aircraft reaches a height of 35 feet and V2 speed with one engine failure having occurred at V ref. Remember that the screen height for wet runway in this case is only 15 feet, or 2. 115% of the distance from the start of the ground roll to the point where the aircraft reaches a height of 35 feet and V2 speed with all engine operating. The longest of those two distances is your require takeoff distance. If is shorter than the available takeoff distance, then you can take off. And if you pay attention, you will notice that, with all engines running, both dry and wet screen height is always 35 feet. In case you need to calculate takeoff run required, is the same as takeoff distance required, but not to the full screen height. For the takeoff run, we take the half point between the liftoff and the screen height. Now, let's see if we can abort the takeoff. The accelerate stop distance required is the total distance an aircraft needs to accelerate to decision speed. V1, continue accelerating for two seconds and then abort the takeoff safely, coming to a full stop. Why two seconds? Well, that is the pilot reaction time to an event. If accelerate stop distance required is greater than accelerate stop distance available, rejecting the takeoff at V1 could result in a runway overrun, making it a no-go situation. Let's calculate it. The accelerate stop distance required is the longest of 1. The distance taken to accelerate to V ref, loose one engine, continue accelerating to V1, continue accelerating for two seconds and then come to a full stop. Or the distance taken to accelerate to V1, continue accelerating for two seconds and then come to a full stop. The longest of those two distances is your accelerate stop distance required. Remember reverse thrust is not taken into account in this calculation. Now, let's see if we can land. Landing distance required is the total distance an aircraft needs to land safely. It starts at the point where the aircraft reaches 50 feet above the runway and includes the full rollout until it comes to a full stop. For flight planning purposes, the landing distance required must be a maximum of a 60% of the landing distance available. For the planned destination airport, and also for our alternate airport. Some operators can be certified under certain conditions to have a reduce requirements for planning purposes only. But what a pilot must calculate? Well, close to our descent, we must calculate the in flight landing distance required based on the actual weather, aircraft, and runway conditions and this must include a minimum of a 15% safety margin. And needless to say is that in order to commence an approach, the landing distance available must be greater than the landing distance required, including the 15% safety margin. In other words, if we can land and stop safely within that specific runway in actual conditions. A very important concept that most operators strive for is the balanced field length. 
The balanced field length is the runway length at which the distance required to continue takeoff after reaching V1 is equal to the distance required to abort the takeoff and come to a full stop. In other words, it's the point where accelerate stop distance required is equal to takeoff distance required. Rejecting or continuing the takeoff at V1 requires the same amount of runway. Understanding declared and required distances is essential for every pilot, ensuring safe takeoffs, landings, and proper performance calculations. Next time you're reviewing runway distances on your charts, remember, it's not just about how much runway is available, but how much your aircraft actually needs. If you found this video helpful, make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel and drop a comment below. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.